in this video, I'm going to give just sort of a very brief overview of, uh, well, of what band structure actually means. And so in the future, I'm going to make a video series on inorganic chemistry where I'll get into like the group theory and molecular orbital theory and all those kinds of things. And so for now, this is going to be uh, a fairly sort of broad overview. And so the band structures in some kind of material are generated when you put these, uh, when you put a bunch of atoms together, you start increasing the number of these uh, molecular orbitals. Uh, and so, you know, when you have one atom, you just have this one. When you have two, you have two, so on and so forth. You get up to 30. You see you have a bunch of these energy levels that are all very close together. Uh, and then you go up to, you know, something that's close to like Avogadro's number here. And it's essentially just a continuum. And so there is, you know, a, just tons of different, you know, Avogadro's number level of uh, uh, magnitude of different molecular orbital orbitals here. And so these are the bands. And so this these uh, bonding molecular orbitals and non-bonding molecular orbitals, I'm not going to get too much into that except to say that uh, once you fill one of these things up, one of these bands up, then it's no longer involved in actually bonding two atoms together. And that makes sense because if uh, an atom has all of its valence uh, electrons filled, such as like a noble gas, it doesn't uh, react with anything. It doesn't want to bond with anything. Uh, there are some, you know, exceptions even with the uh, with the noble gases, but uh, that's kind of outside uh, outside the realm that we're in here. Uh, but so the idea though is that these energy bands can be, you know, filled. Uh, partially or even filled the, f the full way or they can even be empty and they become sort of uh, conducting bands uh, but so the the bands are based on the type of orbital so we can have the s orbitals down here and this has its band and then we have p orbitals and this has its band uh, but as n goes up the band gap between them gets closer and closer together uh, and we actually get to this point here we're at 3s and 3p uh, these bands actually kind of overlap and so you get this uh, large band here and you can see that this is showing that sodium only fills this band up a little bit magnesium since it has that extra electron fills it up a little bit more, aluminum a little bit more. So these are all in the uh, same period here, uh, in the same period on the periodic table. And so each one is just an extra electron. We see that this is filling it up uh, just a little bit. Uh, where these core bands down here, so these atomic orbitals are not uh, contributing to the bonding of these things together. If we have, you know, just like a chunk of pure sodium or a chunk of pure magnesium or a chunk of pure aluminum. Uh, and so we can see that these bands can be partially filled. Uh, and then so the difference uh, between the sort of filled one and the empty one uh, we get these these band gaps here. And so we saw in the previous couple videos how these band gaps come about because of sort of the periodicity of potentials in our substance. And so different, uh, different atoms are going to have different band gaps in them. And so the transition metals, uh, so the stuff that's like in the center of the periodic table looks like this where it actually has this overlap in the in its sort of highest valence uh, band here and its uh, lowest conductor uh, conductance band here and so that's why metals are very good conductors because the it doesn't take much energy at all for an electron to uh, move from the valence band here up to the conductance band here, where a semiconductor is one that has a small gap like this. And so uh, a little bit of ener bit more energy is needed to get something uh, to move past this, uh, this band gap here. Whereas an insulator is something that has a large band gap. And 
And so even if you're applying a, a large potential to it, uh, you're not going to be able to get electrons to move from the, the, uh, the valence band here up to the conductance band here, or conduction band. And so this is just uh, a few examples of these. So diamond, which is uh, not that great of a conductor, has this larger band gap. So you need to put this much energy in in order to get uh, the electrons to move from the valence band up to the conduction band, whereas silicon is uh, much smaller and then uh, germanium is actually even smaller than that where germanium is in the same uh, it's in the same group as silicon it's just one one lower period or one period down from silicon and so these are uh, sort of natural semiconductors where uh, most things are not natural semiconductors and you have to add uh, doping agents to them and things like that. Uh, and in fact, that's what we will talk about here is uh, we can have this P-doped and this gallium doped here. So this is phosphorus and this is gallium. And so phosphorus, which is in the same uh, group as nitrogen, has an extra uh, electron in its valence shell compared to silicon. And so it uh, it can sort of add another electron. So it sort of it has this donor level that's uh, higher than the valence band of, of the pure silicon. And so it takes less energy to move that electron into the conduction band. And so these are uh, are called n-type semiconductors. Uh, so n because it's negative, because it's giving an electron. Uh, or we can have these p-type semiconductors, which p for positive because it's sort of bringing a an electron hole. And so you can actually get electrons from the valence band to sort of promote up uh, into this acceptor level, which is which has a smaller band gap than between the pure silicon valence band and conduction band. And so uh, adding these uh, doping agents sort of allows you to make something into more of a semiconductor. And then we can put the P-type and N-type together to make what's called a P-N junction. Uh, and some electrons in the N-type con conduction band move into the P-type valence band. Uh, so that at equilibrium, the N-type becomes positively charged and the P-type negatively charged. And so I actually have, uh, so I adapted these from my inorganic chemistry textbook, uh, but I kind of made these myself. So this is sort of at equilibrium here. And so we can kind of think about, uh, you know, when you put these two things together, some of the electrons in in the N-type are going to sort of move down here to the P-type. Because remember, the P-type is bringing sort of extra holes with it, where N-type is sort of bringing extra electrons with it. Uh, and so you sort of generate a positive charge over here and a negative charge over here at equilibrium. Uh, but then we can uh, apply a voltage. And so if we apply a voltage where we have negative here on the N side and positive here on the P side, so we're adding electrons here on the N side because uh, we're adding the negative charge there. Uh, and this one, so in a lot of uh, resources it talks about uh, adding these sort of electron holes, the quote unquote electron holes, which uh, essentially just means taking electrons away. Uh, but you can think about because if you, uh, you know, if you have like uh, some atoms here and you have an electron right here, and so it moves over here, you can almost think of like the lack of electron here moving that way. And so elect these electron holes sort of move in the opposite direction of electrons. And so you often see it uh, in this sort of electron hole sort of notation. So you can kind of see 
this idea of like the electrons and the holes uh, come and meet each other here. Uh, and so this is what's called forward biased and uh, this will allow a current to actually move through it. And so this one, uh, so now we're applying the positive on this side and the negative on this side. And so the, uh, applying a positive means we're sort of taking electrons away. And uh, when we're taking holes away, we're adding electrons, but uh, there isn't sort of enough to uh, move electrons up that way. And so, uh, because if we're adding electrons here and taking them away over here, then there would be sort of a, a net flow of electrons that way. But uh, you need energy to sort of uh, move them up here, whereas this one, the electrons are sort of falling in energy, and so that is uh, favored, and, and that's why in the forward bias, you can actually get a current to go through, where in the, uh, in the reverse bias, so, uh, so that's uh, sort of the rules that I have, I'm talking about here. So in the reverse bias, uh, you, can't, you don't have this current moving through, and so it, it only allows current to move one way through it and not the other. And so those are called diodes. And so that is what a, a diode is. Uh, but then we can think about, uh, so volt photovoltaic cells and light emitting diodes. And so that is what I have over here. So uh, if we just have some light, so we have this light coming in, it excites this electron, which is able to move up here uh, and then uh, we are adding electrons so uh, we have holes moving out of here because we're adding electrons and we sort of have this net electron flow this way and the reason it's allowed now is because we have this light here which is providing the energy for the electrons to move up this energy level from the uh, valence band into the conduction band up here. And so you can actually do this uh, in reverse sort of. So if you sort of uh, applied, so say we, we, so ignoring these red arrows here, say we took, uh, we wanted to apply a charge or uh, a current here. So say we we have our electrons here and we're applying it, uh, then as the electrons fall down, we can actually give off some light. Uh, and so the, the light that it gives off is going to be based on sort of the distance between, uh, between this conduction band and this, uh, this valence band here. And so the sort of difference between them is what will sort of determine the wavelength, the wavelength uh, or the color, the color of light. And so that's why uh, these light emitting diodes often have, you know, this very sort of pure looking light. It's a very pure uh, color of light. Uh, and so it's just sort of doing the photovoltaic effect in reverse. We have the electrons coming in, they come down, giving off this energy as light as it goes down, and then kind of keeps going this way. Whereas you could think of, uh, now we have the holes sort of, you know, moving up that way. Uh, but anyway, that is sort of, uh, you know, I guess kind of the reason why we care about, you know, these conduction bands and stuff because it does have to do with sort of the conductivity and semiconductivity and things like that of different materials and allows us to do things uh, like this where you know you can you can have the have this be uh, be small enough you can have this be small enough here that uh, that heat could actually could actually uh, sort of make this uh, happen here. So you could have heat actually turn on the current in your system. And so like a heat detector kind of a thing. Uh, and so, uh, you know, there's a lot of different things you can do with it. And obviously like transistors and computers are all based on this kind of stuff. These uh, silicon, uh, 
these silicon semiconductors and things like that. And so this is all very important in uh, materials science and, and, you know, computers and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, uh, I don't want to ramble too much. Uh, I hope you found this video somewhat enlightening, and I will see you in the next one.